We continue with our Bible studies uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 3. And we've looked in depth in chapter 2, uh, probably in more depth than we will at almost any other part of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the ministry, work, theology, a background of the Holy Spirit. If you've been following this, uh, you know all that we've covered. I can't say you know all there is to know because we can never know all there is to know. And especially when we come to talking about God and his nature. However, we press on now with the narrative of uh, what began to happen after Pentecost. So the first few verses of, uh, the first uh, ten verses I think, of uh, Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then, they went, then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Lord, open your word to my heart and my heart to your word that I might grow in you. First thing we want to notice is what Peter and John were doing in the first place. Sometimes we, we skip over the little detail to get to the big story. And of course, that's where we're heading. But first of all, we must uh, just take on board. One day, Peter and, God, and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Always, always remember that these early followers of Jesus these first disciples, these the apostles who had received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, who had been with Jesus throughout his three-year ministry, uh, through all the ups and downs and the awful tragedies, hardships, blessings and joy of walking with Jesus. They were Jews. And we must always acknowledge our Jewish heritage within Christianity. Now, some people become obsessed with a kind of neo-modern-day uh, Israel obsession uh, about uh, Judaism and uh, strange interpretations of the end times and so on and so forth. That's not what I'm talking about. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are the parents, uh, the patriarchs uh, of the story, the salvation history of the scriptures. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are the ancestors in every sense of these people. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Moses, David and all the prophets are their inheritance and we as Christians through their uh, move into following Jesus, himself a Jew, an observant Jew, uh, and through their conversion into this uh, new moment in the covenant walk with God, uh, have remained racially, ethnically Jewish. Uh, they're never going to be anything other than that. And it just is beyond my ken as to how uh, people who claim to be followers in the way of Jesus can be disparaging of uh, and hateful towards Jews. Uh, and uh, it's something we must uh, resist, resist, resist. That doesn't mean that the narrative isn't uh, a 
an account of the clashes that took place between this uh, newborn thing and the hierarchy and institutes, institutions of Judaism. That does not mean we're being anti-Semitic. It just means we are examining what had gone on at the time. And of course, the, the text will take a stance. Now, there are problematic things that are said in the text. I absolutely acknowledge that. Uh, and I'm never quite sure how to disentangle myself from that. Uh, but we have to face into it as we come along. But note from this uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 that they continued in their observance of the rituals. That word ritual is often used in a disparaging way, particularly by Protestants. Never quite understand that because it's uh, it just is about what people do. Every form of religious practice has ritual. I went to a Quaker school uh, and the Quakers would have claimed, perhaps in their early days, a more intelligent insight from within Quakerism would acknowledge this, that there are certain rituals that emerge in every group of people. It's just part of human psychology and the reality of how we deal with the world. We develop rituals. And we're very disparaging of ritual. Oh, those people just keep ritual. People say that about us as Anglicans. You're just ritualistic. Uh, but ritual is absolutely part and parcel of what we are and what we do. And they kept to the rituals and practices, the ordinances of Jewish practice. And they're going into the temple. They're not just arbitrarily strolling in. They're going in at the appointed time when the prayers would be said. So they're going in for the service, as we would say it in modern parlance. They're going in at that time, at three in the afternoon. Luke is specific about this. So please note that. Uh, there's a foolishness uh, in the background I came from and widely spread that uh, liturgy and formulae uh, in acts of worship uh, were not present in the early church. Uh, there are there's very strong uh, evidence that some of the very ancient uh, liturgies that are being used even today in places like the Syriac Orthodox Church uh, predate the writing down of the Gospels. Uh, why would Jewish observant Jewish people who have faith in Jesus abandon everything that had gone before? Because actually nothing wrong with it at all. Uh, what they do move away from, of course, is the sacrifices. And we'll come to that in due course. Now, we've looked at that. There's a man lying at the gate and uh, he's crippled. I am not a social anthropologist who can give you all the ins and outs about beggars. I could go and look it up and try and make myself look really smart uh, uh, about the social status and so on of, of, of beggars. Uh, but this is how this man existed. He was reliant and he positioned himself in a good place because people going to worship should, in their hearts, be given to generosity of spirit, should be given to compassion. People who are entering into the worship of the one true almighty God uh, should have compassion upon the broken and the poor. Uh, and he knows that. And as he saw Peter and John coming, uh, he asks them for some money. It's what he does. It's how he lives. It's how he uh, has food to eat day by day and presumably maybe somewhere over his, a roof over his head at night or a shelter at least to go to. Uh, and he asks them for money. It's Peter and John, two of the original disciples and two of Jesus' inner circle who were present at very key moments, such as the uh, uh, the transfiguration of Jesus. It's Peter and John, two of the early leaders of the disciples. And an extraordinary thing unfolds. Peter says, look at us. And so the man gave his attention, expecting something from them. He didn't expect what he got. Do we come? 
to God? Do we place ourselves in proximity to God, expecting something? Have we an expectant spirit? And he's expecting a gift of money. And his heart must have dropped. Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. Probably an excuse he's heard before. Or just rolls his eyes, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. And what he has is the most precious thing in the whole of human history. He has the presence of Christ within him by the Holy Spirit. And that presence of Christ empowers him and emboldens him to face into whatever need presents itself at any given time. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. A very, very important part of our faith is that we pray in the name of Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven that is given to us. The name of Jesus is the authoritative name. It is the name of the Son of God. It is the name in which we resist evil. It is in the name of Jesus in which we perform great acts for God. And our prayers should end, for the most part, invoking the name of Jesus. And we should finish our prayers with phrases like, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, or in the name of Jesus we ask, or in the name of Jesus we come to you, O Lord, asking in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now you probably notice at the beginning I prayed that little prayer and I didn't use it. I was conscious uh, that I was falling short of what I was about to say. But by and large our prayers should as a rule have the name of Jesus. Now here's the thing about prayer and I'm going off a slight tangent. If you begin by addressing a prayer to the Father halfway through the prayer you don't say and thank you for dying on the cross. All right. Whoever, wherever in the Godhead you begin to address your prayer, you continue, unless you deliberately point out that you're starting, if you like, a new paragraph in the prayer. You know, so you begin, and almost a, an addendum to the prayer. So if you begin, Heavenly Father, we beseech thee. Heavenly Father, we come to you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross. It's a model, theologically. And perhaps I'm being too Pharisaic, perhaps I'm being too uh, rigid in this, but there is a truth in it. If we address the Father, we continue to address the Father in the prayer. Unless, as I say, we come, you know, halfway down the prayer in our mind, or it might be written before us, and we say, and Lord Jesus, we come to you and give you thanks. But you don't thank the Father for dying on the cross. He didn't. The Son died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. So it's it, it's it's like, and I remember uh, a friend in, in, in college being a little bit wicked to another guy in college who'd gone and, and bought a cross to wear around his neck. And like me, he came from uh, that part of the country where it probably wasn't natural for him in the first place to go and buy a cross. It was a step he was taking uh, regarding his background and his, his ongoing theology uh, that he was taking. And he'd gone into a Christian shop and he bought a cross that he liked and it had a dove on it. And one of the guys said to him, I think, friend, you've got the wrong member of the Trinity on the cross there. And, uh, of course, it caused all sorts of sniggers. But mean. So it makes me smile. Because he did, you know. He did it the wrong uh, it was the wrong thing. And that's just an illustration of my point. It's, we come to the Father in um, the name of Jesus because it's because of Jesus that we have free access to the Father. The veil in the temple dropped, tore in two and fell. That veil shut off the symbolic, the emblematic place, the Holy of Holies where it was believed that humanity in the form of the Jewish people and in the form of the appointed priest, humanity engaged with 
the God of gods in the Holy of Holies. And the temple veil rips and drops. And that's symbolic uh, to us of the opening out of our relationship with God, the availability of God. The availability of God comes at the price of the death of Jesus and the incarnation of Christ and the presence of Christ and the self-sacrifice of, of Jesus. And that that happens at the, at the moment of his passing, at the moment of his death on the cross. There's this opening out that in the name of Jesus, every one of us has access to the Father. Because of Jesus, we don't have to take any other route. And I've had this discussion with lovely brothers and sisters in the faith. So many, most of them actually high Anglicans, very high Anglicans, as opposed to, to uh, uh, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic people, high Anglo-Catholic people, people within my own tradition who, who follow a, a different path within the tradition. Uh, and, you know, I've had this discussion I, I, that there is... No place in my background or theology or, or need to go via any other intercessor because there's one intercessor, there's one advocate between God and man, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So everything is done by, through, and in the name of, by, through, and in the power of the name of Jesus. Everything is done in his name. I can only come freely and openly as an individual we can only come freely and openly, communally in our worship. We can only come as humanity because Jesus has opened the pathway to the Holy of Holies, to the very throne of the God of gods. And he is, uh, it's part of the reason why he is referred to as our great high priest, as well as the sacrifice. He's many things in the terminology of scripture. So it's in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, that we come in every and all circumstances. Taking him by his right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles were strong. He jumped on his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, uh, walking and jumping and praising God, making a fuss, drawing attention to himself. Uh, he couldn't help it. He was full of exuberance. He had a life-transforming encounter with God. Now, I want to come to this because people will say the only way you can have life-transforming encounter with God is if you pray the sinner's prayer. I ask you to go into Scripture and produce to me the sinner's prayer. Those who say they use only Bible and Scripture show to me the sinner's prayer that everybody who needs to get into heaven and everybody who wants their sins to be forgiven has to say the sinner's prayer. Show me even the phrase, the sinner's prayer. And I will humbly bow to you when you do. We also have a theology and a background of people using terminology of inviting Jesus into your heart. Terminology I've used myself. Show me the terminology and the scripture for that. This man's life has been transformed by his healing and he's praising God. He is in fellowship with God. He's in fellowship with the disciples. He's in a new place. His life has changed utterly and he is praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I, sorry, somebody's come in through the front door of the dog. I had the dogs over there and they're barking. Shh! Go to bed. Be quiet. No. Doesn't happen in church, does it? When you don't drink coffee in your jammies when you're in church either. Alright. So, just to... to Bring round off my thoughts on this, and we'll go on with the, the next bit. The next bit's uh, quite detailed in, in the follow up to this. And I just want to say about the miraculous. We talked about the gifts, we talked about the miraculous. Let's not be superstitious about the miraculous. And some people are, you know. I was running late and I prayed the bus would still be there. And a miracle of miracles, the Lord had made sure the bus was there for me. 
the God of all creation, the God of all the universe, held up a bus so that somebody who hadn't bothered to get up and out of the house in time would get on the bus. Never mind the other 40 people sitting on the bus who are being kept late. They don't matter. Their prayers aren't being answered. They're praying, please leave. But we, Mr. Christian or Mrs. Christian, running up the street, praying for the bus to be there because they couldn't be bothered to move quickly enough. You see what I mean? That's superstition. Uh, and driving out a car park, praying for a parking space. The God who created all things, the God who brings us this salvation, the Lord of Lords, is going to provide you with a parking space. That's superstition. Uh, and then we use the language, a wee miracle. A wee miracle happened. And I believe in my wee miracles. You know, let's lift ourselves. A miracle is the extraordinary. And we see the miracles in the Acts of the Apostles, these signs and wonders in the Acts of the Apostles and right through Scripture. Remember I referred uh, to that uh, illustration that was given that if you were on a desert island and you had nothing to read and the Bible floated up and you'd never read a Bible before and you read it, you would come to the conclusion that the Christian faith is a faith of the miraculous. Well, of course it is. We have a virgin birth. We have a baptism encounter. We have a death and resurrection. We have all these things. And we have Jesus miraculously healing the sick and raising the dead. The miraculous is deeply rooted in every part of our faith. Of course it's miraculous. But let's not reduce it to, you know, God is, you know, the God of God's Yahweh. You know, the God of God's the holiest of holies, the ancient of days. The God of everything is like a rabbit's foot for me to rub and make things happen. The miraculous intervention of God into this man's life was transformational and it is a testimony 2,000 years later that we're still talking about. The miracles are in absolutely integral to the ministry of Jesus. We we'll come to this in due course, but later on in Acts chapter 10, St. Peter says this about uh, them preaching the gospel and about the ministry and work of Jesus. He talks about Jesus, he says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Healing was part of the ministry of Jesus. And if we are in the ministry of Jesus, we are about the ministry of healing, as we are about the ministry of reconciliation, as we are about the, the ministry of compassion, as we are about the ministry of salvation and redemption, we are about this whole ministry of Jesus and healing is part of it. It's problematic because it raises all sorts of questions, A, about the nature of suffering in the first place, and B, about how some people are healed and other people are not. And you get all sorts of mad theologies thrown at you about that. And I've known of somebody who was told that she had a lump on her breast. This was somebody who was going to pray with her for her healing. That she had a lump on her breast. But she must have done something for this curse to be upon her. Bad. Wrong theology. Stay away. You hear that stuff? Stand up and walk out. Just go away from it. It's wrong. It's not biblical. It's not Christ-like. It's nothing of the compassion of God. So if you've got a lump on your breast and somebody says to you, oh, you have to seek back through your your walk with God in life and, and you must have done something. And this girl racked her brain. She said, well, you know, I did, I did go topless sunbathing 20 years ago. There you are. There's your sin. I'm sorry. No. Uh, I'm not having it at all. So it raises the question as to why there's sin, why, why there's suffering, why there's disease. And so I think it's a, it plays a large part in why many people in the church have shied away from a ministry of healing. I think we have to grasp it without knowing the answer to that. I think we have to step into it and say, we're going to pray for people's healing. We're going to do what Jesus did. We're going to do what the disciples did. We're going to lay hands on the sick and pray for their healing. And 
It's God's ministry. It's the ministry of Jesus. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It comes with the sovereign power of the Father. But I'm going to pray for your healing because it's what Jesus has told us to do. It's what Jesus has shown us to do. It's what the disciples did. And it's not something just for way back there. But we have to be careful that we don't mix it through with all sorts of false theologies, false teaching, false philosophies about the nature of illness, suffering, uh, and all the, the problems that Christianity and every other faith must face into. But we have a calling to pray for the healing of the sick. And we should pray for the healing of the sick. And in God's good, good grace, from time to time, we will see a wonderful, usually very gentle and quiet intervention by God. I've yet to see anybody... Uh, walking and leaping and praising God in this way uh, but it could happen watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing watch out for the charlatans watch out for the false teachers and false doctrines just simply follow in the way of Jesus and say this is what the Lord wants of us we lay hands on the sick and pray for their healing uh, it's his ministry and here we've seen it with real power and it's a demonstration of God's power that draws attention to the disciples, not just drawing attention to the disciples, but through the disciples draws attention to Jesus, draws attention to the Father, draws attention to the veracity, the truth of this claim, that this Spirit is the Spirit of God, and they walk in the way of Christ, and in walking the way of Christ, they walk in the will of the Father. And... That is why this and other miracles are in this story. So people are amazed. People are amazed. What follows next is that Peter gives one of his great sermons to the onlookers. We'll come back to that next time. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry, they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And all healing comes from God. We pray for our doctors and nurses. We pray for our hospitals and health service. We pray for the suffering and why we don't understand. We, in faith, pray for the healing of our nation and the healing of the world. Lord, we place all these things into your hands in faith and hope. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Sunday coming, the 19th of July, at 11.30, in the rectory field, the front of St. Luke's, Ballymar, there will be a drive-in service. If you're coming, come only with those with whom you live, share the car with them, and uh, when you come, uh, be there please by 11.15 so we can get you safely parked and distribute service sheets and so on. Last time we did it blowing a gale, lashing rain, didn't matter. We had a great time in the presence of God. These have been a real blessing to us. On Sunday week, uh, St Luke's Mullet Glass will reopen and there will be more on here and you will receive more information over the days to come regarding the reopening of our churches for public worship. In the meantime, public worship will take place on Sunday at Ballymire, but there will be a recorded service available as well. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.